Hello and welcome to a new Mendix Expert Developer webinar. My name is Jan de Vries and I will be your host for today. Today's webinar will be about successfully integrating UX in Mendix projects and will be presented by Willem Gorisse, Senior UX Designer at Mendix. During the webinar you can submit your questions in the question window in GoToWebinar. After the presentation we will go through them one by one. The questions and answers will be added to the webinar page afterwards. Before we start, please look at the handouts window in GoToWebinar to find the presentation slides. Thank you for joining and enjoy the presentation. I'll now give the floor to Willem. Good afternoon and good morning to you all. Uh, I'm Willem uh, Gorsen and welcome to today's webinar. Together we'll explore on how to integrate UX semantics projects. Now, there are many ways to include UX in Agile projects, but not all of them lead to success, be that in outcome or in time and effort invested. I hope to not only provide everyone with insight into the subject, but also to offer a more tangible aid to get you started. Now, let's have a look at what subjects we'll be covering today. First off, I'll briefly cover two prerequisites that together provide context for the rest of the webinar. I'll then take a closer look at ways to be agile in UX, after which I'll dive into the project UX templates, covering everything from preparation to finish. To further understanding of how to successfully implement UX, we'll have a look at how UX effort can be balanced in projects. And lastly, I'll be showing how a Mendix partner from the Netherlands handles UX in their projects. And of course, there will also be time for questions and some thoughts to take home. Now, due to the limited time that we have in this webinar, it's impossible for us to cover everything in detail. However, we do need some context for the rest of the webinar, so it's important to at least know what knowledge is prerequisite. I hope most of you are already familiar with the subjects of Scrum and UX design. If not, do feel free to ask questions at the end of the webinar. Now, first off, Scrum. Aside from being a famous formation in rugby, Scrum is the best known agile methodology for developing software. We're using two to four week sprints as a way of iterating, each sprint providing an opportunity to test, evaluate, learn and adapt. Contrary to a more traditional waterfall approach, Scrum assumes to not have a 100% clear picture of what the end product should be, adopting to change one of its core characteristics. Mendix has a tremendous fit with the methodology and hence advocates it as an optimal way of using the platform. Now, apart from the comparison between high-performing cross-functional teams and a rugby formation, the picture does actually remind me a bit of the so-called war rooms in which uh, most of the scrum perspiration takes place. Secondly, UX design and what it entails. So let's have another look at the Mendix UX pyramid that was covered in an earlier webinar by my colleague uh, Russell Hyde. Now, most of you will be familiar to an extent with styling, in which we alter the visual appearance of elements, such as a button. Theming in Mendix is all about translating a visual identity, such as your corporate identity, to an application. UI design takes it a step further, where we actually need to design the pages as a whole that the user is going to see. Usability adds a layer on top of that making sure the application can be worked with and is accessible. Interaction design is all about the interaction with the user and it deals with screen specific details as well as an entire workflow in the application. Now if you mix all of the above together and add a touch of human emotion, which sometimes can be stronger than logic, we come to the field of experience design. Now, I'm sure that most of you have had some experience with UX design in your projects, most likely in a more waterfall kind of setting where the design was done up front or pasted on at the end of the project. Now, although this might be logical to some, this is actually pretty impossible to combine with agile methodologies such as Scrum. So let's dive into the wonderful world of agile UX. First, let's examine some challenges 
from a UX point of view. In the blue, a nice bit of prose I found on the internet with a good sense of humor, but definitely also a lot of insight. And some of the reasons why adoption to Agile is so hard comes from the more deliverables that we have, the more time and effort it will take to adjust and adapt. And back in the day, the designers were supposed to deliver the perfect design. Being agile means perfection for a single iteration lifespan without knowing everything. And this is a completely different mindset. How can we do proper research if we only have two weeks of time each print? We used to have three months for just the research. Now, although this is not always true, most of the time there is no user stakeholder involved in the process. And lastly, UX is a very broad area of expertise and I don't think there is any UX designer that can actually do it all. So how do we cope with these small team sizes? If you look at it from a different angle though, the developer's point of view, we also find some very interesting challenges. Uh, um, the first one is a very valid remark, design upfront is not agile, it just isn't. And most of the time designers want too much and it's too hard to realize within my time frame of a sprint. They're also not fluent in technical jargon or concepts which makes communicating with them very hard. And why can't the design and the ideas fit within the technical implementation and architecture that's already there? Sprints are really too short to wait for design, so a high risk of rework is involved. And it's very hard to work closely with people that are outside of the team. And if you look at Scrum, the team is committed to the end result, so if you're not on the team, how are you committed to it? Fortunately, iterative working has the same advantages for design projects as it has for development. And I think if you squint your eyes just a bit, you can see the sprint concept from Scrum in there. You think about what is needed, you then create it and validate if the result is really what was needed. If you look at some characteristics, it's no wonder that it's inspired by lean and agile development theories. We're just too busy learning from the previous iteration, uh, creating better versions and validating that one. And when you iterate with a lot of testing, that's automatically going to lead to focus on the actual result. Now, in order to be successful in implementing a lean UX project, I think uh, the following uh, is important. You need to focus on the actual applications and not so much on pretty mock-ups and plan. You really need to validate, test and validate some more. And in order to do that, we need something to test, of course. But most importantly, don't lose track of the big picture. User stories can be very deceiving due to their granular nature. And to link back to Scrum, it's or it's not an, of, an official manifesto, but I really like the link that of an agile manifesto. Um, I don't think customer is the right word, I'd say uh, the actual users, you need to validate it uh, to know that what you're building uh, is adding value. I think collaboration is what being agile is all about. Because we can is probably not the best answer to why we're creating stuff. And this one is good as well due to the appropriate, that's probably the most important world word in any Agile context and uh, just keep up the pace. Sprints are short, we need to work fast. Now the good fit with Mendix uh, is actually easy to see because uh, a lot of Mendix projects they only have two week sprints. Uh, Mendix believes in quick successes so starting with the core is key. Microflows I think are a perfect example of this because they were meant to bring IT and business together by making it visual and our credo is fail fast and learn fast and you almost don't prototype a Mendix, you just build it. But don't forget, it doesn't have to be perfect, it just needs to have a good fit. 
So, so far we've talking about Scrum, what UX is, and specifically Lean UX as a way to implement it. Now I think it's time to combine everything together, and we're going to use the Mendix Project UX templates as a framework for that. So, the Project UX templates are basically templates for Mendix projects with a focus on the user experience integration. They outline all the UX related responsibilities and deliverables, plotted on a timeline. And our own expert services department has dealt with an incredible diverse range of projects over the years. And we've learned what works well and what doesn't within these projects. Now these templates are a way for us to share our experiences and best practices when it comes to integration of UX within projects. They exist just to offer a helping hand for everybody who's interested in optimizing their outcome. And note that they're not set in stone. They offer a good starting point in guidance, but they're in no way compelling. Now for illustrative purposes, we've taken a four sprint long project. And if we zoom in on the timeline aspects of the templates, we can identify three distinct phases. The preparation phase, the sprinting phase, and lastly, the usability testing phase. We'll go over these three phases in that order. So let's start with the preparation phase. For as Mr. Graham Bell used to say, by failing to prepare, we are preparing to fail. An interesting fact is that Scrum doesn't actually say anything about how to prepare for a project. That doesn't mean, however, that we don't need any preparation. For like any other project, Agile projects need an horizon to work towards a uh, sort of a vision that serves as the fundament of it all. The important to remember is not to overdo it. Don't paste the waterfall preparation onto an Agile development process. That last bit about not overdoing anything, that might be tricky. How do we know if we hit that sweet spot of preparation effort? Now what can help is having a clear idea of what the goals are of the preparation phase. And I think we can sum it up. If we're ready to start a project, if we're ready to deliver some business value, if we have a clear vision and know what the horizon entails, if we can do some high level forecasting of our project, and if we have just enough detail in our preparation to start with the first print. Now the quote is certainly true. If one of the best compliments I ever got in a project where we actually used the project templates was that it helps in doing everything right the first time, which was completely true because we almost had to do no rework at all in the project. Now of course, there are many ways to get to this point. And the methodology that we at Mendix advocate is that of the product vision and canvas. Now note that this methodology is nothing UX specific. It all has to do with proper preparation, creating that horizon to work towards, as well as providing focus. The first element of the methodology comprises of the product vision, which is a high level vision. Um, you'll see an example on the slide and it basically answers a few very important questions. A clear idea of why an application is uh, created. Now, this might be less common than you think. Who are we doing it for? And what are their needs? And what's the solution that we want to offer them? And uh, lastly, but very important as well, how do we benefit from this? Now note that this doesn't always have to be a financial gain. So after our high level vision is clear, it's time to get more practical so that we can get ready to start on our project. So let's start prepping the project by answering with a little bit more detail the following questions. Now personas will answer the question of who our users are. We'll use user journeys to give body to the user's tasks and a way of completing them. Now, high level constraints could be uh, it's only available on tablets or it needs to work within a single sign-on environment. And I think the design can be summed up in how are we going to realize the user journeys. Uh, ergo, what do we need to build to interact with our users? Taking all this into consideration, 
what epics can we identify and which user stories can we create to get that first print going. And know that it's crucial to take a minimum approach and account for emerging design uh, needs. I think for this web webinar's purpose, it's good to dive a bit deeper into some uh, perhaps new concepts uh, like the personas, user journeys and uh, the typical de design assets. So if you go to personas, uh, the most prominent characteristics would be that they're not actually real persons, but they're an archetype model of a large group of users and they're based on research, just like science. Um, they will improve empathy and understanding of the user for everyone involved in the project and they'll definitely help focus the design and development efforts in projects. Now if we translate these personas back to Mendix, it'll look something like the image that is shown. After we create our personas, we'll use them first in the Sprinter environment for helping create user stories and after that we'll translate them into user and module roles uh, in the modeler itself. Now after we've done our research regarding our users, we know who they are and what they need to accomplish in our applications. Creating user journeys is a way to bridge that gap. We basically want to sketch out the journeys the users will undertake. Now there are different levels of abstraction that we can use to create and map out our journeys. The customer journeys they're a bit more common in the world of marketing. They map out the total experience. Storyboards are much more concrete and they offer a great way to add context and enable storytelling. And they look a bit like graphic novels or uh, things you would see in the movie industry. And at the lowest level of abstraction, we have user flows, which are quite similar to micro flows. Now creating user flows uh, that's an advised minimum for most projects to get going. In almost every case, we can translate one of these user journeys into an epic, which, as most of you know, can be split up into user stories and tasks to be picked up in a sprint. Now the design section of the product canvas, that can wildly vary depending on the type of application, the type of customer and the maturity of that customer in terms of using the Mendix platform. Now it's best to get a professional opinion when trying to figure out what is needed in a specific project. Uh, note by the way that we'll need both the personas as well as the user journeys to be able to start working on the design. Uh, we'll, we'll look into some possible design assets. Note that it's just possible you can have others as well but these are good to start with. I think wireframes are probably familiar to most of you. Um, there's a lot of freedom in how high the fidelity is of the wireframing uh, and the amount that you want to do to get a start. Again, try not to overdo it. Creating sitemaps is actually a common practice when you create websites, but they work perfectly for online applications as well. It's very easy to make, yet incredibly powerful in getting off to a good start and preventing rework. Now using style tiles is a very nifty way of designing just the look and feel of an application without getting lost in its functionality. Uh, it's basically a first step in translating a corporate identity to an application identity. And of course, it's always possible that a company already has great documentation and guidelines which cover design principles. Now all the assets we just discussed should basically cover the design of the application, which in turn can be translated into the blueprints of our application, covering pages, use of widgets, and the theming of an application. A good tip for remaining agile is to design a system or a design framework instead of separate and individual pages. It will not only secure the agility in design, but it will also provide a good fit with the Mendix platform. So, we now know our business goals, who our users are, what and how they will accomplish their tasks, and we already have a rough idea on how the application will be structured and look like. So it's time to get on with the show, it's uh, time to start sprinting. 
When looking at the concept of a sprint, there are some characteristics which are worth noting. Uh, firstly, the Scrum team itself is responsible for the end result. And in order to take on that responsibility, all the knowledge and expertise needs to be on the team. However, that doesn't mean that external experts are not permitted. In fact, using their knowledge is a very good thing to do. And due to the fact that Scrum teams have between three and nine members, Mendix team even go as low as three members in it, it's very important to have the right kind of people in it. We'll need T-shaped people. Now, T-shaped people basically are people with a lot of cross-functional knowledge combined with an in-depth expertise. And if we plot that on how to successfully integrate UX, it means the following. UX designers need to become full-fledged team members. It's the only way that UX can have a good fit with agile projects. And business de developers need to expand their broad base with UX. Uh, note that the former will lead to the latter. Zooming in on some of the UX responsibilities during sprints, we can identify some of the following areas and assets. The designing of the experience. Now, since we didn't overdo our preparation, and since we're learning and adapting each sprint, the designing of the experience is still an important part of a sprint. So, we'll see the creation of new wireframes, new user flows, and other assets as deliverables. The next responsibility is that of the implementing of the design. But this is very much a shared responsibility with the entire team. The, the most obvious point where a good cooperation between expertises is crucial for success. We need to apply the look and feel and a consistent experience is a very important part of UX and quality assurance is critical for that. This will lead to a consistent application via the quality assurance. We'll be saving time and doing less rework an overall better user experience of the application, and we'll get reusable assets such as the theming package and page templates. Now, in my humble opinion, the most important ingredient for repeatable success is strengthening the team. The power of a UX designer lies not in an ivory tower, but it lies in the trenches where it creates bridges between the users and the entire team. Now, the role of a product owner I think that might as well be the most difficult role there is, maintaining a holistic vision, appeasing all the stakeholders and guiding the team. I think they basically need all the help that they can get. And as the corny saying goes, there is no I in team. Uh, being a team player is critical. You need to do whatever is needed to reach that sprint goal. And it definitely is a team effort. And I think the best designers are not of the dictator kind, but of the evangelist kind. And they're never, never too shy to learn new traits. And if you do this right, this will actually lead to a faster and more efficient team. By learning from others, it's unavoidable to become a better designer. Also, integrating UX in teams will rub off on team members, making them better developers. And last not least, the overall quality of the application will increase. So now that we've covered our preparation and we've already went through two sprints, it's time to validate and test all the assumptions and the ideas that we had. Now the goal is being to learn from it and improve our product. So it's time for some usability testing. Usability testing is somewhat of a special breed of testing that supplements rather than replaces the regular testing. Its focus is not on finding bugs or past failed outcomes. It's about finding usability issues that can be improved upon. And as improvement is key, it's done throughout the project. The earlier, the better. And I think it's worth noting that it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It really is easy. There's almost nothing to it. So what exactly is usability testing? Basically, it's really just watching real people use the application with the goal of either 
making it easier to use or proving that it's already easy to use. Now there are many methods of usability testing available and not all of them have a good fit with a fast-paced and dynamic project. Uh, important is a good fit with Scrum as a methodology and Mendix as a platform. And we can identify some factors that we need in order to get that good fit. Now first, we need a qualitative approach rather than a quantitative one because we want to iterate and improve, not prove points by delivering statistically sound proof. The approach needs to be accessible and easy to pick up as we have limited space of experts. Remember that most Mendix team will only consist of three people. And last, it needs to be fast because we're on board a very high speed train and we're speeding towards success. Luckily, there's a very solid tested methodology available that really is heaps of fun to do and it has some amazing characteristics. With practice, everyone in the team can do it. It just takes one morning a month. Only three participants are, are enough to get into the biggest usability issues and everyone gets to participate in translating these sessions to tangible points of improvement. Now that being said, in the end, it still is always better to have a professional on board or revert to more extensive methods. If it's possible within the project, then go for it. Translating back into the Mendix platform, so our users basically get some tasks to perform uh, and our application to perform them in. In return, we get a nice list of usability issues that we can then translate into new user stories for the next sprint. At this point, we've covered the preparation, the sprinting, and the usability testing phase. Now, since I promised a tangible aid for successfully integrating UX at the beginning of the webinar, it's time to refocus on the actual templates. So let's get on with it, shall we? So after discussing the types of phases, we'll, deep, we'll dive a bit deeper into the templates. Every phase has four blocks or paragraphs, if you will. The UX responsibilities, they map out all the things that need to be done in that phase. Uh, examples being designing user journeys, creating wireframes, or setting up a usability test. Now those responsibilities, they're going to lead to dedicated UX deliverables having a very direct link with the field of UX. The examples of these are wireframes, personas, and user flows. They also lead to general UX uh, deliverables, which are more all-round deliverables that need the effort of the entire team. Examples are pages being created, content, and our product vision and canvas boards. Alternative needs is a section that gives you an idea of how the template can be enhanced, such as with the creation of style tiles. Now some further important notes to make. Having T-shaped people in our team means we don't always need a UX expert. But that's, that doesn't matter because the templates are still useful if it's more of a roadmap towards a user-friendly application and it's definitely not limited to UX expert and most of what's in the templates already exists in every project. The only difference being that with the template approach we make it tangible and easier to communicate and align ourselves on. For example, if we don't use any wireframing in our project, we're overlooking the fact that there actually is wireframing being done. Because every time someone creates a page in Mendix, they're in fact creating a wireframe inside of their heads. Now, the problem with this is that we can't look inside of each other's heads. So there's no way of knowing whether the mind wireframe is the one that is needed. We'll only know after the fact, and that leads to a high risk of re rework. Now, this is just one example, but the same goes for our user journeys, our navigation architecture, our testing, and of course, the actual usage of the application after it went live. For those of you that are interested in trying out page templates, getting started with it is as easy as it gets. We'll add the templates and relevant documents to the online page of this webinar for everyone to download. 
And after you pull in the files, just adjust them where necessary for every project because no project is the same. You then start with your project and it's good to be agile with the template as well. So evaluate it every sprint and tinker with it to account for every emergent need. And last but not least, enjoy the successes that are reached with it. So, I'd like to thank all of you already for still being here in this webinar. Um, I know that we've already dealt with a lot of information uh, and we're really getting close to the end, but I really still want to share three topics with you. Uh, the balancing of UX effort in projects. Uh, I'd like to give an example from one of our partners uh, and some thoughts to take home. But first, the balancing of effort. Now, apart from what kind of effort is needed in project, balancing that effort is also crucial for success. I've plotted the UX effort on the, on the sprints of a project. And as we can see, UX effort almost never is a straight line. Aside from having to create a holistic design system for the application in the beginning, creating deliverables that can be used, it's also important to spread as much knowledge as possible concerning the UX of the application. That way, the team will become less and less dependent on pure UX expertise, and they'll be able to pick up more themselves. And one other thing to note, uh, that while it's true that not every project needs a UX professional, it will still be more efficient to use one, because just the more experience you get, the faster you can work. Now, if we plot the UX effort on the three phases of Mendix, being the start, structure, and scale, we can actually see a similar trend due to a holistic portfolio-wide approach of UX. We'll have reusable assets, like guidelines and theming uh, packages. We'll have increased UX level of our team members. And we'll probably have in-house expertise as well, instead of project-based external expertise. Now, when working with the project templates, it's always good to consider these two graphs when adjusting the template to fit your project. And I'm very happy to say that already we're seeing great things happen in the Mendix community. And I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to highlight one of our partners. Um, on the left, a testimonial from one of Flowfabric's clients, stating that the UX effort led to a more intuitive process as well as a major increase in user friendliness. Now, to the right is the metric that actually proves the testimonial, a 50% increase in efficiency. And it's definitely a great result achieved, and I'm sure that no one will have any doubts with regards to the return on investments of the UX efforts that were put into that product. But how did they manage to pull it off? Now, if we look at how Flowfabric integrates UX in their projects, we see the following. They have dedicated UX designers that are working on projects. They are involved from very early on in a project. In fact, they team up a business analyst together with a UX designer for every intake. They use a preparation phase in the shape of a zero sprint. And UX involvement remains throughout the project. Now, quality assurance is realized through a UX review uh, of the application at the end. Now, before we open up the line for questions, um, I'd like to give you a few, a few thoughts to take home with you. Now, as already mentioned, UX is in almost every project, even when there's no UX designer involved. Every page we create, every workflow, every navigational structure, every device choice, it's all UX. And the biggest reason for wanting to integrate UX in projects is that UX is an integral part of an application. Hence, it's not an accessory to be pasted on. I think ivory towers are really so 2006. Right now, it's all about the team. T-shaped people, they can basically rule the world. Everyone 
can draw a wireframe or a storyboard. It doesn't have to look like a Da Vinci. It just needs to enable the exchanging of thoughts. And don't forget, have fun. Now let's open up the line for questions. It's question time, and thanks for watching. All right, thank you very much, uh, Willem. That was a, a great presentation, a lot of information. Uh, let's have a look at some of the questions. You can now open the questions window and uh, enter your questions, and we'll go through them uh, one by one. Uh, we already have a question by Marnix. The question is, what is your advice if a UX designer or uh, design something that is not possible, technically, in a standard Mendix solution, such as an autocomplete input field in a search box? This is a very common uh, challenge. So we have a design, we have usability uh, uh, things that we want to achieve, and they're not in the standard Mendix package. Um, luckily for us, Mendix is more of a more of a building kit, more like Lego than than it's set in stone. So uh, I think the first thing that you should always do is first try to come up with alternatives that actually still use uh, standard Mendix components. Now, even with creative usage of these components, you still can't create what you're trying to create. Then it's actually time to think about creating a custom widget for it. Um, I think in the end, the custom widgets may sound uh, a little bit scary, but uh, custom widgets is a part of Mendix, uh, and it is to be uh, used for, I think, exactly these kinds of purposes. However, uh, if you can solve it by cleverly putting together the standard uh, components, that would be the first way to go. All right, thank you very much for the answer. Uh, the next question is, uh, which kind of books, what kind of books do you um, recommend uh, if you want to get into this type of UX design more, uh, or perhaps a specific training? I'd say actually start with uh, with downloading all the documents uh, that are going to be posted uh, uh, on the page of this webinar first because um, some of the stuff I talked about they're actually in uh, 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 in the project templates as well so on one hand in the documents there's just a template but uh, I've included some of the concepts uh, uh, in, in there as well, explaining what we're talking about, and each of those, they have uh, a few links uh, if you want to know more. Um, I think the one I can think of now, which is just good fun to read and is really meant for people, not me, like not real UX designers, but for just people who are really interested in it, uh, the book Don't Make Me Think. I think uh, I think that's one of uh, one of the most hilarious books I've ever ever read. Uh, just go with that. All right, great, thank you. Um, well, Gunnar asks, can we download the UX templates? Um, yes, all the templates will be available uh, after the webinar. We will post them on the webinar uh, page, the sign up page, and uh, we'll send you an email when the recording is up and uh, when all these templates are available. Yeah. Um, uh, you also ask, will you provide the presentation deck? Uh, we added this as a handout to the webinar, but apparently it's not coming through to some people. Uh, the webinar will also be available on the webinar uh, page uh, afterwards. Uh, now, uh, Antheus asks, as a beginner in the Mendix environment, diving into this sea of information can be complicated. Uh, where would you say is a good place to start learning and improving? For example, a good learning website for beginners. That's a tough question. Um, 
what's a good place to start? Because, well, diving into the Mendix environment, that can mean loads of things. So, do you need other things for Mendix? I would say no. You, you, you can learn Mendix just from uh, uh, some of the stuff that, that we from Mendix have. So, we have an online course. Uh, it's free. Uh, we have a great forum. We uh, have how-tos. We have blog posts. So for Mendix, uh, you're good with all those assets. Now, if you're thinking about more of the implementation side of the UX design, uh, then HTML, CSS, JavaScript would be uh, your best friends. And to be perfectly honest, there's so much available uh, on these subjects. Uh, which is the best one? Uh, I actually don't know. It's uh, uh, just, no, I can't give you a good answer for, for that. There's too much around. Yeah, I guess it also very much depends on, uh, you know, what's your style, what what do you like to do, and, and uh, um, what do you really want to get into, uh, in, into more depth? Actually, I think I do have something to add to the question. <laughs> uh, I'd say get a pen, get a paper, and if you're interested in, in, in doing more of a UX design, then just start drawing storyboards, start drawing wireframes, and just forget about all the intricacies of all our electronics, of our computers, of all our tools, of all our environments. I'd actually say that the first thing that you could practice is just sketching some on paper. All right, so uh, thank you very much for the elaborate answer. Uh, Michael asks a question, would you recommend UX to go through the Mendix training to understand constraints? Uh, is there such a training? The answer is actually yes and no at the same time. Now, this is a little bit complicated. So uh, in order to learn the Mendix framework, like we have loads of stuff already available but if you're thinking about how do we get to all the specifics that you want to know uh, according to what's possible what's not what's hard what's simple with if you want to uh, do some some user experience quality stuff in Mendix um, I'd say that the best way to get there is just build an application or jump inside of a project now for instance if you work at a customer Customer or at a partner, uh, and is doing Mendix projects, and you're you're in charge of the UX design. Simply ask, no, no, no. Let me be a junior developer on the project first, because there you will learn exactly how Mendix works, but most importantly, how Mendix projects work, how the dynamics of that are. You'll learn so much stuff from from your teammates and. Uh, I think you only need to do it once, and then you'll be so much richer uh, in becoming a better designer for Mendix applications. So, uh, yeah, build an app. I think that's the best advice. Just start doing it. Um, Michelle asks, are there any specific tools next to Mendix to support this process in you know, uh, UX design? There are many tools, and fortunately, um, uh, if you look at the downloadables that come with this webinar, I've also included uh, some templates for stuff as the personas and the product vision, uh, and I've tried to make them as an interactive PDF so you don't need any complex tools in order to use them in your project. Uh, now, of course, aside from that, uh, I think you have some great tools out there. I think Balsamic is a really good one for uh, just wireframing that's accessible to everyone. It doesn't matter who's on the team. You, you don't need to be a UX designer to use Balsamic. Uh, there are a lot of people working, uh, working with Sketch. There are a lot of people working with uh, Envision to cr create a little bit more interactive mockups. Uh, I myself am still a, a huge fan of the Adobe uh, Creative Switch, which unfortunately is expensive, but uh, uh, well, you actually get a lot from it. And uh, again, 
I think my best friend is still pen and paper. I think I've I've jotted down the best ideas and projects uh, on napkins. All right. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, if there are any more questions, please enter them down the questions window, and uh, we'll try to answer them uh, as best as possible. So we'll take some time to uh, to wait for some new questions. All right, we have a question coming in from Andrew. Uh, should usability testing always be done with users outside of the organization, or can they be done internally? That's actually a really interesting question. Now, um, I think it's unavoidable to, to use them inside of the organization as well. If you're actually working on on internal applications, uh, it's always best to to uh, uh, to get as close to the real deal as you can get. Now, um, I think in most usability testing methods, fortunately, there is a big emphasis on uh, a relaxed atmosphere, on uh, on uh, on uh, creating an environment where everything can be said and everything is possible. So I think my advice would be if you were to use internal users would be not to put the manager in the same room. Put them somewhere else uh, and then just do the testing. And uh, I think uh, uh, it's always good to mention to everyone that usability testing, you're testing the application and not the people who are working with it. So uh, if you do that, then um, I think it will work out just fine for internal users as well. All right, thank you all very much. Um, any other questions you may have, you can always uh, contact us through the forum uh, or send in feedback items, and uh, we'll try to answer you as, uh, as best as we can. Um, so that's it for today. Uh, please don't forget to, to leave your feedback on the way out. Thank you for joining, and see you next time.